Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation to come to your uh, country. Yes, okay. Um, this lecture suits in the, in the previous uh, lectures because this is also a very, very rare disorder. Uh, and I have faced this disorder in my career now for approximately 30 times. Uh, and I will discuss with you the new guideline which will appear, I think, in the next three months in uh, GPGN. And as you know, chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction is a failure of the gastrointestinal tract to propel its contents through an un unobstructed lumen, as shown on this picture with the dilated belly and, uh, and the loops on the, uh, the uh, X-ray. And as you know, um, motility is based on a uh, combination of uh, neurons, muscles, uh, and the important interstitial cells uh, of Cajal. Oh, this is the pointer. This is the pointer. Um, and um, if you look in the literature, um, several people have looked at the differences in the origin of the pseudo-obstruction. Uh, Heineke in 1999, Carlo Di Lorenzo in 2002, and as you can appreciate from this slide, uh, then uh, in some of these children you, you will find an, uh, a neuropathy, uh, some of them, half of them, um, you will find in myopathy, but in also uh, 10 to 20 percent of the cases, we, we don't know what the origin is of uh, this, um, this rare disorder. So if we look at the literature, there is a clear lack of clarity with respect to the ACO pathogenesis, the diagnostic criteria, the classification. Um, and because it's such a rare disease, of course, um, there's not enough expertise in this field. Uh, and what protocol should we use to, uh, to face uh, this rare disorder? And because it's so difficult and these children are so sick, what are the best treatment options? So you probably know that there is a delayed referral of these children or a diagnosis uh, of 11 years. There's repeated unnecessary abdominal surgeries three to four, five times before specialist referral. There's a poor fee tolerance in many of these children. And many of these children, not 100%, but almost 100% of these children end up on long life parental nutrition. And of course, uh, for you who face these patients, know that there are severe complications with ne nearly 90 days per year in hospital stay with a high mortality rate, and as you know and heard from the previous talks, there are parental nutrition-related complications and poor quality of life. So there's an overall poor outcome with high motility rates, and in some children, there's uh, intentional transplantation needed, and I will come back to that uh, later. So because of the rarity of this disease, um, Nikhil Thapar from um, Great Ormond Street Hospital in the UK was asked to form a group of people to discuss um, uh, the clinical symptoms, uh, diagnostic tools, and treatment of children with uh, uh, intestinal pseudo-obstruction. As you can see, uh, people from the Europe and from the United States, uh, both uh, pediatric gastroenterologists, but also pediatric surgeons who are experienced in transplantation, but also two very um, uh, experienced uh, adult gastroenterologists, Roberto Di Giorgio and Charlie Knowles, formed uh, uh, our group. So this is the spectrum um, in, uh, in children. Of course, we sometimes make the diagnosis uh, in utero, uh, and there is in uh, the difference with, uh, with the adults is uh, in children it's a more rapid progression, whereas in adults it sometimes is a slow progression to severe disease. So if we look at the symptoms, is there a, is there a difference between children and adults? Uh, the symptoms on signs of intestinal obstruction, no mechanical cause identified, dilated gut with fluid levels. But this is not always the case in, uh, in adults. Um, and if we look at the, um, the children, it's mostly congenital, whereas in adults it's more acquired. And as I already suggested, it might be the case that the etiology of uh, of pseudo-obstruction in children is different uh, compared to that of adults. 
So if we closely look at the children, as I already said, there is a rapidly progress uh, if you compare it with adults. There's a, a huge overlap with other feeding or disorders in children. And we have to keep in mind that even in these very severe motility cases, there might be the case of fabricated induced illness. And to make the diagnosis, we need manometry. I come back later to that. So this was the term, chronic intestinal pseudoobstruction, which uh, diagnosed both children and adults. But because of the differences between children and adults, we changed now the term in pediatric intestinal pseudoobstruction. And for children and for pediatricians, this is easy to recognize. We call it now PIPO. And on the right side, the PIPO you see is a very famous PIPO in the Netherlands, and all children know him over there. So what is the definition which will be um, listed in, in the publication? It's a disorder characterized by a chronic, which means the persistence for two months from birth, at least six months thereafter, of an ability of the gastrointestinal tract to propel its contents, mimicking mechanical obstruction, and then the most important part of the sentence in the absence of any lesion occluding the gut. The diagnostic uh, criteria, it's an inability to maintain adequate nutrition and growth uh, on feeding, recurrent, which is also uh, very important, and persistently dynated small intestinal loops with, of course, air fluid levels, and objective measure of small intestinal neuromuscular involvement, and in those cases you need either a biopsy or a manometry. And if you are able to find abnormalities, then it's uh, really nice to find some genetic or metabolic abnormalities associated with this uh, syndrome. Uh, there are some genes located and found now which are associated with uh, pseudo-obstruction uh, syndrome, but Today, if you read the literature, almost every year, two or three new genes are available associated with um, a different kind of pseudo-obstruction syndrome. So how common is this uh, rare disorder? Well, there are some, there are not many data, but there are some data from the United States. Uh, and in this case, it's one per 40,000 live birth with an equal sex incidence. But there's a very nice recent uh, na uh, nationwide survey made in, uh, in Japan, and in this case, they found a, an incidence of one in 270,000 children having uh, symptoms of pseudo-obstruction syndrome. And almost half of these children in Japan developed this uh, pseudo-obstruction in the neonatal period. And again, they didn't find any difference between the incidence in male or female. So what we now try to do, although it's only the beginning, that we try to form an expert group and we suggest everybody to send, for instance, biopsies to the um, uh, Great Ormond Hospital to have a national but also international registry, as the, the previous speaker also suggested, to have more uh, experience in these uh, rare disorders. So, I don't have the email address here, but if you want to find Nico Thapar, it's very, diff uh, very easy to find him on, on the internet. So what are the signs and symptoms that suggest the diagnosis of SIPO? Well, prenatal signs can be detected in approximately one-fifth of all cases, uh, but um, the majority of cases present already within the first month, and 80% even by one year of age. Uh, the other cases, and you probably have them in your own practice as well, uh, they are detected having pseudo-obstruction throughout the first, uh, sometimes 10 years of life. So in these papers uh, listed over, over here on the, on the left, uh, so there are not that many papers, but those who have looked at this, the different symptoms of uh, pseudo-obstruction, you will find that abdominal distension is probably the most common symptom uh, of, uh, of pseudo-obstruction, but also vomiting, constipation, failure to thrive are very common in these, uh, in these children. Um, then also very important if you look at the, if you suspect children to have pseudo-obstruction uh, antenatally, 
then we have to look for the bladder as well, because these are two common signs, not only the, uh, the, 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 the gastrointestinal tract is involved, but in these cases, uh, the, the bladder is also involved and very specific for pseudo-obstruction. Keep in mind that if you have a motility disorder very early in life, then you, re you really need to exclude, of course, Hirschsprung disease and hypothyroidism. And we have to think about pseudo-obstruction if there is uh, persistent obstructive symptoms after LETS procedure for malrotation. So what do you need for a diagnosis? Do you need abdominal radiography, contrast studies, intestinal transit studies, manometry, histopathology, surgery? So of course this is the main uh, item of uh, diagnostics in, uh, to, to have a child suspected of pseudo-obstruction because almost all children have a dilatation of a part of the gastrointestinal tract as shown clearly on the abdominal x-ray on the uh, right side. Um, a little difference from the young children to the older children is that uh, um, almost half of the children do have air fluid levels uh, identified on the x-ray, but in, um, as this slide suggests, it's not the case in all children. So we recommend that, um, to, uh, that uh, you need an abdominal radiography if you suspect a child of having uh, uh, pediatric intestinal pseudo-obstruction. Um, then the contrast studies, um, um, you can, with this, uh, the, 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 co the, the, the contrast studies, of course, you can assess the extent of the intestinal dilatation, and it's more important to exclude the organi organic lesions, uh, which might also the case in these children. Uh, the transit study should not be used to assess uh, strands it. So we hardly use the radiopac markers, which we do use in children with functional constipation. The same is true for scintigraphy. We don't use, use this in the, in, uh, the workup of um, uh, the pseudo-obstruction, and the same is true for the C13 breast test or the H2 breast test. We do use this if we suspect the children of, of course, having uh, small bowel uh, overgrowth. So what about manometry? As I suggested in one of the first slides, this is probably the most important uh, study we have to do in children with, um, uh, with uh, motility disorders and then specifically pseudo obstruction. I don't know if you have these equipments uh, in your practice because we of course use it really, really rarely and the patterns are very spe uh, specific and sometimes difficult to recognize. Uh, in our center, we are able to perform uh, antrodunum manometry from the age of three years of age, but for instance, in, I know from the people from London that they do it even in younger children. But you have to keep in mind it's an invasive uh, study. And on this slide, you, you can appreciate the normal uh, small bowel pattern with here the phase three activity, and you have to keep this pattern in mind because I now show you some abnormalities. Um, uh, in this case, there is a myopathy where you can appreciate that there's hardly any motility, although there is some uh, phase uh, three, but different than compared to the uh, earlier slide, uh, phase three activity. And in this, this, this is what we call a myopathy. And this is a case of uh, a very disturbed neuro neurological regulation of the motility pattern, and this is the, the typical example of an antrodium nomenometry showing uh, a neuropathy. Again, I already told you that um, in some cases where you clearly cannot understand what's going on and these children come to the hospital very often, you have to keep in mind that there might be a pediatric uh, falsification disorder. And this uh, very nice paper from Paul Hyman from the United States clearly shows you the differences between those children with the pediatric falsification disorder and the pseudo-obstruction syndrome. Because as you can appreciate that in c cases with uh, pseudo-obstruction syndrome, then for instance the dilated bowel on x-ray was never seen in those cases where, as in the pseudo-obstruction syndrome, the, uh, all children had, of course, dilated bowel loops. And the same was true for 
the manometry, which was uh, clearly abnormal in all children with pseudo obstruction syndrome, but, but was still abnormal in two children with the falsification disorder. But please keep this in mind in children with severe motility disorders, uh, pediatric falsification uh, can, be, can play a role. So we clearly recommend to do antrodrenal manometry uh, in these children to make the diagnosis and sometimes clarify the pathophysiology um, to the parents. Then we don't do, um, uh, we, we uh, do not do the esophageal or colonic manometry, but um, if you consider it, then uh, it, you can use it to assess the extent of the disease, but again, we don't do this uh, on a regular basis. Then very important in the, the diagnosis, of course, of, uh, of the intestinal pseudo-obstruction, how to do a biopsy. You can either do it laparoscopically or uh, during the stoma formation um, or during laparotomy. Um, I show you the, one of the next slides. I show you the paper where you can uh, specifically look how you take the biopsy and what, um, what uh, fluid you have to uh, take the biopsy. Uh, and how to uh, analyze it. Um, in many cases, in our hands, uh, if you look at the, the, the cases from Great Auburn Street again, then they find usually abnormalities in the biopsy. In our hand, we hardly find abnormalities in the biopsy. So in, in the majority, although the children do have abnormal manometry, do have the clear symptoms of pseudo-obstruction, they still have normal biopsy, and we don't understand uh, exactly why, and I think it's therefore very important to send the biopsies to, um, to, to uh, laboratories where they face these biopsies more, uh, uh, more often than we do, so that's what we're doing right now. And if you look at the biopsies from, uh, again, from the, the British, then you find in the majority of cases uh, neuropathy as the reason, as the cause for our pseudo obstructions in their samples. And this is the paper I was talking about. It's uh, a fairly old paper from 2009, but you can find everything how to, uh, to, uh, to use uh, the biopsies and how to settle them. Okay. So um, the most important uh, information from this slide is please take the biopsies, send them to very good labs, and then hopefully uh, you will find abnormalities, but as I told you, in many cases in our hands, we didn't find any uh, histological abnormality in these children. Also very important is please rule out Hirschsprung's disease be because you never know if this mimics pseudo-obstruction with almost the same um, symptomatology. So how do we treat these children? Well, the nutrition to preserve growth and development, uh, limit symptoms and improve quality of life, and of course prevent complications. So nutrition plays a critical role in uh, pseudo obstruction in children. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, of course, children have to grow and develop, but we have no clue if good food can recover uh, gut function. In my opinion, there's only a little reason to expect that the, 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 the gut will recover, uh, but we still uh, are not 100% sure. Um, as I told you, in the majority of cases, they're dependent on parental nutrition, and as the former speaker also showed you, there are, of course, very uh, familiar related parental nutrition uh, related complications. <coughs> so if possible, then wean of the parental nutrition and then start on, on, on uh, small amounts of enteral nutrition um, and you never know if, um, if the child can finally tolerate enteral nutrition. I have some patients who were on parental nutrition for 15 years and then suddenly they were able to uh, have some enteral nutrition. So it's not, uh, never, uh, it's, there's no reason to give up hope. So you give it slowly, you can do it continuously or via bolus, liquids, via solids. We, you can try the hydrolysides. Uh, you can use, yes, two minutes, thank you. Oral versus um, uh, the, the gastrostomy versus unostomy. Uh, and of course, closely look at the laboratory of these children. Um, 
parental nutrition, I have discussed it a little bit. It has been life-saving and in our hands we are now so specialized that many of these children have with, with uh, minor complications parental nutrition in these cases for more than 10 years. But of course, you have to look for the central line infections, the, the, the thrombosis, so we start very uh, early in life to uh, give anti-thrombosis therapy. And we, of course, you have to uh, look for liver disease. Uh, the increased risk giving parental nutrition uh, in those children who are very young, have a very short bowel remnant, and in those children with myopathic disease. If we look at the um, at home parental nutrition in our hands, it's safe with a probability of survival and the, the survival rates as shown on the slides are very high. And this is very strange for me to, um, to accept because it shows that there's no difference in health-related quality of life in those children receiving long home parental nutrition compared to healthy controls. But this is the result of a study. But if you have experience in dealing with these children, then you do know that the health-related quality of life is very low. They sleep less. There's, they're they're uh, very often in the hospital. So, But this is the result of, uh, of the study. Um, uh, only a few words about uh, pharmacotherapy. Uh, you can try to control intestinal inflammation. Of course, if there is bacterial overgrowth, you have to give antibiotics. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you, you can promote GI motility. On this slide, I listed the, difference, the different uh, compounds we have in hand now. But keep in mind that there is no whatever study showing uh, um, the, the success and the effect of these different uh, uh, drugs. Because uh, the disease is too ra rare uh, and um, um, that's therefore we have no uh, reason to, uh, to test it. Okay. Um, yes, I have to stop. Uh, um, thank you very much for your attention. Can you repeat the question? What is the common type of eutero in Saudi Arabia? What is the commonest price? Is it healthy? Is macrophilus? Is hypex? So we have an idea about this. Second part of the question is for macrophilus and eutero you have any proof that should use special things before electron and before bond? for the team because to use special states will give us proof this is my preferred Okay. For the most common type, uh, as Dr. Habsha uh, said, is the uh, congenital cholera losing diarrhea. Uh, this is from Secretary Barth. Uh, 
This will show sometimes the periodic acid shift uh, accumulation of uh, surface effect secretory granules, which is typical for uh, microvellus inclusion disease. Uh, before uh, the second the question, I have a question through the application. The question is to Dr. Harbi Shawush. Regarding cases of chloride diarrhea, the CF like picture, how and when do they present two symptoms? Diarrhea or symptoms of CF occur first. Do I need to read the question? Uh, if I understand the question, that when you think the presentation of congenital chloride diarrhea and the time of presentation of cystic fibrosis, for congenital chloride diarrhea, majority of cases present at birth. When they are born, they are born with very distended abdomen with diarrhea, severe diarrhea, severe electrolyte disturbance. Cystic fibrosis, they usually may be presented weeks later or maybe sometime months. So they may present it either with GI or respiratory. But for congenital chloride diarrhea, it is a pure GI uh, manifestations. So the timing is at birth, cystic fibrosis, it may take maybe weeks or months to, to be presented. Uh, if this is the answer of my, uh, or the question I understand. Thank you. Next question. For trichohepatic? Yes. yes. Okay. For trichohepatic enteropathy, uh, bone marrow transplantation is not indicated. And uh, there has been some experience with some patients in some centers that these patients died after the uh, bone marrow transplantation. They will not get, get benefit from, from bone marrow transplantation. But the best thing for them is, uh, if needed, is intestinal transplantation. And they should continue in IVIG. No, Bomaru is not indicated in such cases. serum renin and aldosterone at time of diagnosis. But it's, well, I don't usually use, use it as a follow-up for you know, maintenance of therapy or for to see the response to uh, salt replacement therapy. Uh, and usually most of the time it's high, even after treatment, it's continue to be high sometimes. So it's not a usual uh, test to be used for testing after the starting treatment. It's usually just only a time of diagnosis. Uh, thank you. Before the third question, I have a question here through the application to Professor Mark Meninga. What is the experience of uh, uh, in this disease of small bowel transplantation? Yes, this, uh, this question is, is very frequently asked, but you have to keep in mind that uh, bowel transplant is uh, uh, the mortality rate in these children with uh, pseudo obstruction is really, really high. 
So again, uh, we never do it in the Netherlands. Uh, if we do it, we send them to uh, Paris, uh, where they have a little bit more uh, experience in, in doing these uh, big operations. But more than half the children will die after uh, transplantation. But of course, uh, if, uh, if the need is so high, uh, then we sometimes send these children for transplantation. Thank you. Aziz? Close to the phone, please. Thanks for the speakers about the cultures and cultures. And I want to ask about the job of the show. The question about the what's your experience with a cross patient who is treated by malaria with self related disease? Because we have cases, one case. By the genetic test at the age of six months, all the uh, symptoms, um, GI symptoms are here, and even uh, biological labs is quite normal, and the results are complete. Any experience of facing more about this uh, scenario? Do you have a gene test for that patient? Yes, yes. Okay, there are cases actually reported where sometimes they can tolerate just high salt intake when they grow up, but in the early lives, in the first years of life, actually they need uh, sodium chloride and potassium chloride. And I found those who are having M47V gene homozygous, actually they need just touch, just very little of salt uh, replacement therapy. But actually, there are cases reported when they grow up, they need just only a No, actually, I, I, I cannot recall if there is any randomized study to show that they grow out of it. Uh, another question through the application to Dr. Habi Shawush. Obviously, conjecture already is taking over the, the many questions. Uh, these, there are ch these children have soiling and major diarrhea. The families are concerned how to help in decreasing the volume for the family and the, the child. Uh, absolutely you are right. Uh, I have five cases out of 29 where they have uh, soiling or stall incontinence. And I tried Captopril for one of my patients, just only one patient. And actually it is helped. So you can't try PPI, you can't try uh, Captopril, and uh, actually it may help, and has been reported uh, uh, cases to control stool incontinence. For how long? Uh, you can use it for maybe weeks, maybe months sometimes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hello, good morning, Can you repeat the question? The TTC mutation, TTC cell mutation, the testicular atresia patients. I know that most of them presented with obstruction, but you know, fifty percent initial presentation with uh, with uh, with motility. The second question.
shows you the dilated bowel loops. If you don't have dilated bowel loops, it clearly is not a good obstruction. And then, uh, if you are familiar with doing these invasive studies like anterior anemometry, I suggest you use it because then you can differentiate between the different motility patterns. As I showed you, uh, you, have, you can have a clear pattern of uh, myopathy. You can have a, a, a pattern of uh, neuropathy. Uh, and then again, um, because it's invasive, you, we do it uh, on the general anesthesia. We place uh, the, the, the catheter. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult for the very young children to lay still uh, the next day and to show the, 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 the patterns. But I know from the people from uh, the UK that they, they were able to do it in, in children, very young children as well. So again, I suggest you use an abdominal x-ray and a second uh, best is the antivenal anemometry. And if, you're, if you need to operate, and of course the tool thickness biopsies uh, it might show you also uh, a clear pattern. Thank you. Uh, last question, please, because we have another. Uh, okay. Uh, I think it's from Royal Commission. My question for Dr. Patrick Did you try a direct application in congenital chloride diarrhea as long before I heard about this medication? I did not try it myself, but actually uh, from the review, uh, it's used and seemed to be very uh, promising uh, medication. And actually, it's uh, just decreased the stool volume and uh, helps sometimes to uh, minimize the salt uh, replacement therapy. Last question. Well, Dr. Harb uh, It's interesting for the patient or twin patient who has different gene mutation. Is it heterozygous mutation or homozygous? Homozygous. Homozygous. Yes. Do you test the parents for the uh, these genes or not? Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, I tried, but for financial reason from the hospital, they refused to uh, test. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for the session. Uh, I would like to have the speaker to stay. Uh, give the microphone to the president of the session again.